I'm Cairo News Radio News Director Charlie Harger. The Pacific Northwest is about to see a long cold snap, something we don't see very often around here. So I thought we'd assemble some local meteorologists who are well known on local social media. Today's guests are Michael Snyder, a full time meteorologist for a major airline. He runs Pacific Northwest Weather Chasers on YouTube. Joe Boomgard Zagrodnik, a full time meteorologist and founder of theconvergencezone.com and Scott Sistek, meteorologist for Fox Weather and a longtime Seattle weather blogger. Uh, so Michael, first of all, let's talk about Christmas. People have been asking, will it be a white Christmas? Won't it be? Uh, what do you think the, the chances are of us getting some snow on the ground and uh, will it technically be a white Christmas? What are your thoughts? Well, for Seattle, it's looking a little bit less likely. It looks like we might have some Mars temperatures just above freezing um, but areas north of Seattle aren't looking too bad um, and the definition is one inch of snow on the ground so you might see some flakes in the air but I don't know if we'll meet that technical definition okay so we'll be close Scott are, are you kind of on board with that that we might have a, a dusting perhaps in the Seattle area yeah, absolutely. It's it's still looking kind of marginal. It looked a little better a few days ago. I know that uh, we actually did a story. There was an odds maker uh, in Europe who put out um, this story of like giving odds of a white Christmas for different cities around the nation. And they put it out like around December 7th and they had Seattle listed at 50 to one odds. And the moment I saw that, I was like, I really wish that this sort of thing was legal to bet on because 50 to one odds and looking at the long range then how cold it was going to be for Christmas. It's like, okay, this is actually pretty, you know, I think the odds are actually much better than 50 to one. Unfortunately, we can't actually do that. But now as the days have gotten closer, it looks like, it, you know, Christmas is now what used to be pretty good idea of snow. It seems to be trending backward or later a little bit. So now Christmas is more on the fringe. Um, I still think we'll probably see some snow. It probably won't be there when you wake up in the morning. Not like that traditional, like, look out the window. Oh, like Christmas sort of thing. But I, I still think we may see some, especially though I live up north at 500 feet. So maybe I'll be luckier than those down in Seattle. But um, it's, it's marginal, but it's not zero. I, I would still put money on 50 to 1 if I could. I see Joe nodding in agreement. Yes, yes, I think Scott's right that um, north of Seattle, for sure, it's looking pretty good. But for Seattle itself, it'll take a bit longer for the Arctic air to come down. And often times the moisture is the big question. So hopefully sometime during the day, maybe later in the afternoon or evening, by then Seattle will see some flakes to put us in the Christmas spirit. And we may also get a little bit of a teaser on Chris on the morning of Christmas Eve as well. Just it's a little marginal, but the models are showing some snow at least a couple hundred feet above sea level on Christmas Eve morning. So it's just a whole period that's full of marginal snow chances with nothing that's really a slam dunk for dropping a widespread couple inches, which is kind of a shame with all the cold air coming behind it. Well, let's talk about that cold air, because it, it seems as if Seattle is going to go into a deep freeze. Uh, what are you seeing, Joe, I, I, the next couple of days after Christmas? And then we'll talk a little later on about that long range forecast. That's right. So the Arctic air is just going to start pouring in through the Fraser Gap and through our mountain passes. Um, so even the air over the ocean is going to be relatively cold. So it's just dropping, dropping, dropping. Um, from the day after Christmas, the 27th, 28th. And I think it's, it looks like right now around the 29th or 30th is when it will bottom out in terms of temperature. And there'll still be a few more snow chances as well for the couple of days after Christmas. So it, it's going to be really wintry around here. And it's, it's really, but by the time it gets as cold as it's going to get, it's going to be a serious hazard for anyone, especially people who are living outdoors, um, with temperatures potentially dropping down into the teens, even in Seattle proper. How, how unusual is this type of weather, Michael, for yeah, us hitting the teens in the Seattle area? Yeah, it's very unusual. I think the last time we did it was what, 2000, I wanna say 2010, I, I might be wrong with that. I know we hit it in 2008. The last time we were below 10 degrees was 1989, some 32 years ago now. So that's pretty rare. 
So it's pretty rare. And uh, are you in alignment with uh, what Joe is saying about those temperatures? I, I mean, there are some outliers in models that have it a little warmer or a little lower. Yeah, it depends on if you get that snow cover. If you get snow cover, light winds and clear skies, you can really drop the temperatures pretty quick around the region. Okay. And, and Scott, you on board with that as well? Absolutely. It's pretty amazing to watch how cold it's the models are looking at. And, you know, some models, some of the like outlying model runs are painting some really like dauntingly cold numbers that we haven't seen probably since the late 80s there. But I think as far as, you know, even, even if it's like 15, 18 for low in Seattle, that's pretty rare. Like Michael said, for here, I think usually, you know, kind of like a traditional Arctic event here, it'll be like 22 for a low in Seattle, it'll be like teens in the outlying areas, but, you know, in the heart of the city with some urban heating, it, it stays in the 20s. And this one's looking like, you know, this could be a pretty good, you know, a, on the bottom edge of where Seattle's temperatures can usually go. And it's really amazing considering the dichotomy of how far above normal we were at times this summer, especially at the end of June, that it's like, okay, now we're flipping the script and now we're trying to push it the other way and see if we, how far below normal we can go in the winter. And, and Scott, can you compare that to the, the heat dome we had in, in late June? I, I, when I look at the pictures, it, it kind of looks like I'm, I'm looking at a picture negative of, of what happened it, then. It's very, you know, the, in, in June, we had the big heat ridge over British Columbia. Now we're talking about the big Arctic ridge over British Columbia. So it's it's sort of like if you just look at a color map and you adjust the color palettes, it could look almost, it could look very similar, but obviously different weather in play. But for me, it's just like, okay, well, that June event was so far beyond the normals that we had ever seen here. And some, some of the outlying models are kind of pushing the cold, like not quite to that extreme, but starting to walk down that path. So I think you know, we're, we look at it and it's like, okay, well, that's, you know, the odds of that happening are very slim, probably single digit percentages or single digit probabilities. But you know, I feel gun shy after June of just like, you know, we saw that, you know, that forecast of 110, 113 in Seattle for like a week to 10 days before it got here. And we're just like, nah, never. It, it, this has got to be eating bad data. And then here it is, it, it you know, happens. Um, so I know a lot of people are pointing that out to us. It's like, you know, when we say, oh, you see these numbers that have these really gaudy low temperatures around here and you, you immediately dismiss it as like not possible or not in the realm. And they say, yeah, but you said the same thing in June. <laughs> so that's kind of in the back of my mind. And Michael, uh, you always have the disclaimer, right? You say, <laughs> well, these are fantasy numbers. Um, what are we looking at in terms of some of the fantasy numbers compared to the greater odds of, of things happening? Well, some of the fantasy numbers actually had us a little bit below zero, and that would be, you know, those are all time record temperature lows. And checking out like Bellingham and Spokane, there was a lot of the ensembles had below uh, zero also. Spokane is just incredible. Take a look at those temperatures, and some of them are showing negative 20 and, and beyond even. It, it's just really insane. Like Scott was saying, that ridge is the driver of this whole thing, the extreme temperatures we got in the summer versus the winter is the same you know the same mechanism going on here the huge ridging and joe i how, how do you temper this when you're talking to family and friends and you know they're looking online at the same stuff you and i are looking at online and you see a a minus two for a low in, in seattle you know 10 days from now uh how, how do you i don't want to say pour cold water on it but uh, how do you moderate those expectations Yes. Yeah, so I think in some ways we've forgotten how cold it used to get around here in, for instance, the 1950s. And when you look at some of these old, I've looked up some of the old uh, radio signs, weather balloons from Kuliut, some of the old reanalysis from the 50s. And I'm like, oh, my God, this not just the 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 magnitude, but the extent of some of those cold air masses covering like a large portion of North America. So it really, the stars like super, super, super have to align because the cold air masses aren't what they used to be. But this one, it's just the upper level pattern to bring it to us is so perfect. And it's been amazing to see some of those numbers looking at the temperatures a mile above the air where the models are more certain of what, of what temperature it's going to be. 
And they're pretty close to some of those all time records and these outlying models. So I'm, I'm like, well, it's not like off the charts cold, but when you're pushing these, re these records that we know have led to temperatures in the single digits, it's pretty crazy to see. So it's, I feel like it's out there, but it's not as far out there as it could be. Hey, Scott, are you in agreement with that? I know you have been a, a blogger who has for a long time followed the weather patterns and weather history in Seattle. And so when you hear Joe say that, it sounds right, right? Oh, absolutely. And uh, it's, it, it's something we haven't seen here in a long time, too. So I think that's part of the deal is it's like, you know, we haven't seen these weather patterns, whatever. If you look at the weather records for January and February 1950, they're ridiculous. It, it's almost like it couldn't have happened. Like there was six weeks where Seattle spent most, not every day, but almost every day was like below 20. And all the record lows, like 18 record loads from January and the first like five or six days of February are all from that same winter. And so obviously it's happened here before, and but we haven't really seen anything close to that since. So if you're looking at like even the fantasy models that are saying minus two, minus three, zero degrees, let's even say it's six, seven, nine degree lows you know, that's still something we haven't seen in 30 years. And so, but it is like, you know, you look at the records and those numbers are in the Seattle record books, as opposed to June, those numbers were not in the record books by any stretch. Like we blew those numbers out of the water by six, eight degrees this time around, even if you're, you know, numbers we haven't seen in a while, they have happened here before. So it's a little different in that regard, but yeah, I think for us, I mean, almost very few people would have been working in weather the last time we've had this kind of numbers, at least even in the even in the fantasy range. So I think for us, it's kind of interesting to look at it because it's sort of like, okay, well, we know it's happened before, but you kind of got to go almost back to ancestral meteorology to find it. <laughs> Michael, let's talk about confidence. When do you start having con confidence that those fantasy numbers might actually happen? Is it five days out, two days out? Is it the day before? When do you start saying, you know what? This might actually happen. Yeah, the, the pattern is in motion now. So the confidence for the cold air arriving is really high as of now. The ridge is there. The, I mean, you can see the systems coming down on the north flow. So the pattern is very high confidence now. And as far as the temperatures go, we might not know exactly, like some of these extreme lows might not happen until a day or two before we're even aware. If if things clear out properly and you've got snow on the ground for Seattle, for example, in a perfect setup with very light offshore wind, you could get below 10 degrees and not know it until a day or two before that actually and occurs. What but about yeah, the, the confidence is very high as of now for the pattern setting. Yeah. Uh, snow. Oh, as far as snow? Yeah. What, yeah what there's going to be several systems that are moving down in the North Flow. And so, Joe, uh, is this the type of thing that where we could see significant accumulation, or is it like a, a couple inches each time? It, it doesn't look like significant accumulations, at least in Seattle. But I will. I think that Michael's point about the snow leading to cold is very important. In 2010, November 2010, SeaTac recorded only two and a half inches of snow. And then the low of 14 came right after that. So it does, you just got to coat the ground and then the snow and then have the clear skies coming afterwards. And that that can get you there. And I'll also say to Scott's point that when we talk about 1950 and the cold air sticking around for six weeks, well, that's another question is when is this cold air mass actually going to clear out? Because some of the extended models now have snow through the first week of January. So it's possible that we might miss the snow in the first round, but then New Year's comes and it eventually shows up. So there's, there's just so many different elements to this. And, and Scott, you and I have talked about this before. We, we generally tend to see snow in Western Washington uh, at, at the beginning of a, a cold snap or at the end of a cold snap. Uh, is that how this is set, setting up as well? Right. Well, that's usually when you can find two of them, but it doesn't mean that you can't have one in between. It's just usually you get some way of going into the cold, which in this case is this Arctic front we're talking about around Christmas and whether it'll still be cold enough, but that's where you can get some of the snow. And then while we're in the cold, it's like unlimited snow events. I mean, you think of December 2008, I don't know how many snow events we had, but it was multiple because it just stayed cold for two weeks and just 
anything that came through was like snow, snow, snow. And then usually what has to scour out the cold air is like some system coming in out of Pacific, like a traditional, you know, regular storm that's on a normal day going to just be 45 degrees here and a bunch of mountain snow, but you dump that into all the cold air that's still stuck around. And that's where you can get like the huge snow event at the start, but then it eventually gets messy. It changes terrain and, and warms up kind of like, you know, an extreme case, if you think if people remember, it's been a while. Now, December 1996 was like the huge like pineapple express came in on top of the cold air and that's how we got like a foot plus of snow and then it was 50 degrees and everything turned to rainy mush and it was a mess don't i don't know that's, like, that's what joe was saying is like we don't see the end of this yet you know and like these last couple of february events it's been like a pretty good snow it's going to last four days and then we see the moderation and this time it's like we see the we see the end point but we don't see the out point yet and everything is just like off the end of the chart is still cold so it's like when does this happen? I think the Midwest has got to cool down first. You know, for me, working with a bunch of people nationally, all they're talking about is how Christmas is dead and how it's going to be 60 degrees this winter for like the third time in December. And they're like, oh, it's you know, it's going to be no white Christmas and it's going to feel like, you know, the start of fall. And I'm like, hello out here. You know, <laughs> it's not so bad or it's not so it's not so warm. But I think that's part of the deal here. They, you know, that's going to be a nice big blocking thing to kind of keep the cold air around here. So it's all connected. And Michael, is this the sort of thing? I mean, it seems like Scott and Joe are both saying this could last a while. Yeah, it absolutely looks like that. This latest GFS run has the cold air going all the way through the first week of January. It even has a couple of pretty uh, moist Pacific systems kind of moving close by too, and they kind of <clears throat> are still sliding by in that north flow. So they never get really inland to scour, to try to scour this Arctic air. And it can be a very intense battle between the Pacific Ocean and the Arctic air at times when you're trying to end these cold streaks. Sometimes it's easier than others, but this one looks pretty persistent. So it's going to be really interesting when some of these Pacific storms try to break down the door on this Arctic air mass. Sometimes you can get our most extreme events like 1996. And I see you nodding in agreement there, Joe. This could last a while. Yeah, I, uh, the bigger the blocking pattern, the more stubborn it tends to be. So, and I, it's, and it's also so cold that yes, there will be some moderation in early January, but still, that's still below the snow level, you know, if we're going from temperatures in the 20s to temperatures in the low 30s, that's still cold enough for snow. And so, Scott, I, one thing that I always worry about, power outages, uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, people who don't have homes, that's going to be a big issue. But do you see anything in the forecast that uh, could lead to power outages? Well, probably the, I mean, heavy snow would be, well, actually, probably the number one thing would be freezing rain. Um, I don't see any of that as a problem for now. That would be an issue for potentially however we get out of the cold if we, when we start getting some milder air in here and how that all matches up. I think in the interim, power outages would be relegated to probably just heavy snow. And so I think in these first few rounds, we're probably okay. I don't see like a big enough snow that it won't be a snow amount that Seattle's not made it through many times before. I think just the cold. I mean, obviously if some power does go out, that's, you know, that's not good wherever it happens. And, but I think it would be pretty isolated nature. I think more pressing is we're looking at an extended cold period for people who don't have shelter. And, and then the ongoing challenge of, okay, well, we need to get them inside, but inside is like the last place where you want a bunch of people right now, because, you know, they might be sick. You don't know how many people are sick with Omicron. And so it's this conundrum. I, I was just talking to, I know somebody who works with the uh, Seattle Union Gospel Mission, and they were asking me like, how bad is this gonna be? We need to start worrying about people out on the streets. And it's like, A, it looks pretty bad as far as being outside for a long time, but I don't know where you're gonna bring people inside to that's just you know not dangerous for other reasons. So they definitely have a major challenge to, and some logistical challenges to work out here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's wrap it up with this. I, I want your best guesses as to how many days this cold snap at last and what you think the the overall accumulation will be during that time span uh so i will put you on the spot first let's see michael michael you you're my my first victim here how long does it last 
and uh, how much snow accumulation do we get? So <clears throat> for Seattle, I think this is going to last probably more than 10 days. <clears throat> so I'll go 10 to 14 days. And I'm going to guess that Seattle sees over a foot of snow. I'm going to go 12 inches for Seattle and lasting 10 to 14 days. What I loved was how the video paused there for a moment and buffered and the, the tension just built up. It was crazy. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's go to Joe. Joe, uh, how long does the cold snap last in total accumulation? Oh, yeah, it's hard to argue with Michael's forecast. I, was, I had the same number in my head. I think, it, I think it'll go through probably January 7th will be my guess. So I think that's I think that's on the high end of Michael's and I'll, I, I'm just going to go big. I'm going to say 15 inches of snow at SeaTac. I think it's, it's, there's nothing in the short term, but I think at the end of this is going to go out with a bang. I'm going to make that bold call. Okay. You're sticking your neck out. I like it. Scott, let's wrap up with you. Do I get, is the price is right rules? Can I go like a 10th of an inch? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the first numbers I had in my head before anyone spoke was 12.1 inches in January 8th. So that's almost exactly what everyone else had here. But again, not 12 inches in one shot. I think if you're just looking at the stat, you know, by the time we get to mid-January, it's like add up all of SeaTac's days. What's its accurate number? I was thinking 12.1. But I do think that it will probably be heavier outside of SeaTac. We'll probably get some crazy numbers. Somewhere I always think like there's February, I forgot what 2003, I think, where like Mount Vernon had 30 inches of snow. And I know um, North Bend and out in the foothills had like crazy amounts in February that were way more than than what Seattle had. So there's gonna be some places around here that get crazy amounts of snow, but as far as downtown Seattle, I think I, I think 12 to 15 is a good good range in there. Okay, and follow me here. We could probably get those measurements if we just stuck with measuring on the lawn furniture, right? <laughs> the that? patio furniture yes <laughs> the pictures of the patio furniture <clears throat> those are the best uh, joe is offended over there i love it hey uh all of you thank you so much for doing this this was a a, a real treat uh, this is going to be online a little bit later today uh, so Scott Sistek from Fox Weather, Michael Snyder of Pacific Northwest Weather Chasers, and Joe Boomgard-Zagrodnik uh, with the ConvergenceZone.com. Thank you all, and uh, Merry Christmas.